Okay, there we go. So I'm really excited about this week because I completely forgot how incredible these three chapters were and how much they really helped get me to the place where I am now. So I'm so excited to talk about... Um, I'm so excited to talk about them with you guys. Hi, Brent. Um, anyway, so I really, have you guys, did you guys get the book and the study guide or did you just get the book? Hey, I hope your day's great. Like the shirt. Thank you. I got this shirt from Target. I wear it way too much, but I like it. So I just wear it, um, you know, about every fourth day. <laughs> you know, I filmed a really awesome um, video today for you guys if you follow my YouTube channel. I filmed a huge um, try on clothing haul. So. Everything from like Target to Nordstrom to um, Macy's, tons and tons of clothes. You just got the book. Okay, that's good because I'm not really even going by the study guide this time. I was last time, but this time I'm just going by the, um... hi Sarah, hi Teresa. I'm just going by the book. I'm just rereading the book kind of like you guys are doing. Um, so if you have any questions, now would be the time to ask them. Hi. I know. Missed you. I haven't talked to you all week. Um, one of my favorite meals. I don't know if you guys ever see my Insta stories, like the little, kind of like a Snapchat for Instagram. I try to post on there daily because I don't always get to post um, like an actual Instagram but when I was in Knoxville, I guess it was, when do we have taco night? Saturday or maybe Sunday night? I don't know. We went to Trader Joe's. Um, they have the most amazing pollo asado. I think that's what it's called. It's incredible. It's so good. But I used that chicken. Um, sorry, I'm talking about food. I'm starving and... I made downstairs chicken alfredo, so I'm just waiting to get finished with this to go eat. So I'm so hungry. But I take that chicken and I make um, tacos out of it. So I just like shred up the chicken and then I get their Mexican corn that's in the freezer section, which is so, so good. And then riced cauliflower. And I will put like um, some avocado on there. If you don't like avocado, get something creamy, like put a little ranch on there, something like that, and then black beans, and it is the easiest recipe. It takes about 10 minutes to get everything cooked. Um, chicken maybe takes a little bit longer, but it's delicious. I just put it, typically I would already have the, um, I would typically, I would already have the meat cooking in the slow cooker or the crock pot. All day long and it'll just be ready for me to make it at dinner time but Jeff doesn't have a crock pot so um, or he may but we just didn't have time so um, I made that and it was delicious and we had the leftovers and it's just so good and so easy so if you want a blog post on those Trader Joe's tacos then let me know because I would love for you to try it out and it's not expensive Trader Joe's is cheap anyway on most things but it's, um, oh, they're so, so good. But that's what I was thinking about just a second ago. I was like, oh, I wish I had those Trader Joe's tacos. They're so good. Do you guys have favorite things that you get at Trader Joe's? Or do you have Trader Joe's? Um, hi, Carrie. Okay, cool. I can do that. Hi. Um, I love... Trader Joe's Reese Cups. They're not Reese's, but that's how I know how to... Um, oh, they're flowers. Yes, their peonies were beautiful. Go to breakfast. Um, I 
love biscuits and bacon. I know you don't want to hear that, and that's not healthy, but I love French toast. If I'm going to eat healthy breakfast, I always will have oatmeal. I put peanut butter in my oatmeal and raisins and a little bit of cinnamon. Um, I don't eat eggs. I don't, oh, they're slimy and gross to me. But I'll have some sort of protein, whether it's bacon, turkey sausage, regular sausage. Um, my problem is I get hungry really quick. So if I don't like load up on the protein, I will be starved in 30 minutes. So I have to, um, and I'll eat some fruit in my oatmeal. I'll eat, well, I'll eat the raisins and then I'll eat like berries or something in there, strawberries. And it's really good. How tall am I? I am 5'5". Five five. A little shrimp. <laughs> A little shrimpy shrimp. Um, other things I love from Trader Joe's, I don't know why we're talking about this, but we have 10 minutes to go, so I'll just talk about it anyway. Um, their cookie butter, I don't know if you've had it, but now they make a cookie butter ice cream that's unbelievable. And I love their cheese selection. Um, I don't drink, but I hear that their two buck chuck, I think is what it's called, wine, it's like $2.00. Um, it's pretty good. What else? Oh, their cereal. It's like a toffee, super nut toffee. It's like honey bunches of oats, but it's a hundred times better. I could eat it. I eat, I was eating it on the way home straight out of the box. My favorite perfume, Joe Malone, Wood Sage and Sea Salt, or, um, I, I loved Flower Bomb, but now it's just kind of like obnoxious to me. Before, I was wearing these strawberries and something. It was in the green, dark green bottle from Jo Malone. I loved that one for summer, but I don't even know if they make that anymore. I think it was like a special edition. Excuse me. What's your favorite perfume? I like more of a... Um, not really a clean scent, too clean, not like a cottony scent, not a super sweet scent. It's got to be like, how do you say that word, vetiver, vetiver, vetiver. You guys know what I'm talking about if I'm pronouncing it incorrectly. You'll know what I mean. That, like more of a little of a warm scent I like, um, but also a little feminine. So I'm not really sure how to describe that. Got about eight minutes to go. Um, yeah, I just, I'm a creature of habit when it comes to my perfume. The Woods Agency Salt is by far probably my favorite perfume I've ever owned. I used to wear Angel from Terry something. And I used to, let's see, Narciso Rodriguez in the black. I have that. How was my week? What did I do? Um... I went to Knoxville on Thursday. I left Thursday morning, and I just got back yesterday um, because I was house hunting all all those days. I was house hunting. Um, and if you've ever tried to buy a house, it's a nightmare. <laughs> I mean, how fortunate are we that we get to purchase a house, but... It's a process. You can like see the stress in my chest and throat as I say that. Um, buying a house is, it's a lot. And, you know, you have 50 real estate agents trying to come at you. And I'm very like do it on my own um, kind of person. So it's hard for me to let someone else like come in and take over. But getting the pre-approval, being first time home buyers, like, there's a whole process to all of that that I kind of knew about, but I had never purchased um, on my own before, so I didn't know. But um, can you do an outfit of the day? I just have on this top and, like, leggings on the bottom. This top is from Target. Um, but home buying is... It can be stressful if you're not careful. You'll catch yourself... Um, kind of just 
going down a rabbit hole of, well, this doesn't have this, and what do we do about this? And people are asking you all these questions about your finances, and you're like, I don't really want to tell you that, and I don't want to tell you how much money I have in the bank. I don't want to tell you about my Roth IRA, like all that. Like, I don't want to tell you about all that. But, you know, it is what it is, right? What's my favorite movie? Um, I love Sweet Home Alabama. I'm a typical Southern girl. It's like one of my favorite movies. I love Casablanca for an old movie. That's one of my favorite movies to watch. Um, gosh, anything with Kate Hudson. I love Kate Hudson. I love anything that makes me laugh. Wedding Crashers, um, <laughs> Ricky Bobby, um, Talladega Nights, if you don't know who Ricky Bobby is. Talladega Nights is a great movie. I just started watching. Jeff got me watching Shit's Creek. And I don't mean like S-H-I-T. I mean like S-C-H-I-T-T-S, I think is what it's called. It is hilarious. It is so funny. It's on Netflix. You have to watch one episode. And you're going to be like, uh, what's wrong with these people? But once you get to know their personalities, you will laugh so hard. Is Jeff my boyfriend? Yes, Jeff is my boyfriend. Um, It's so funny. But when we got in like 10 at night... I, um, like, could barely watch because if you've ever bought your first home, you know, like, it consumes your life. That's all you think about. You're just ready for it to be, like, you find the perfect house. Um, you want to find the perfect house. You want to find, you know, the perfect lender. You want to do all the things, but you want it to be, like, ASAP Rocky, but it doesn't happen like that. And I'm very impatient. I've learned patience, but I'm when it comes to that stuff, I'm like, let's get it done. We're kind of on a time crunch because, um, like, personal reasons, we're on a time crunch. So we need it by August. So if you know the process, it takes so long. And um, how did y'all meet? That's a funny story. I'll tell you in a YouTube video. Will he be in any upcoming YouTube videos? Yes, he will. Um, you're moving from the farmhouse you live at? Yes, I am. I am moving to Knoxville. Yes. Um, depending on how soon it'll be, um, by August, I will be in Knoxville. I <laughs> can't wait to meet him. Yes, he's incredible. He's awesome. Okay, got about three minutes. Um, Anyway, so we thought we found the perfect house, and then there was, like, the whole foundation was falling out from under the house, so we obviously couldn't get it. How far is Knoxville from Nashville? It's three hours. Do you have any favorite boutique stores for clothing? If so, what are they? Boutiques in Nashville, I own my own, so I don't really shop at other people's boutiques. Um, I know Red Dress Boutique here on Instagram, like, kills it. They have the best boutique. It's so cute. Um, why am I moving? Hopefully a new job. That's kind of like what we're waiting on um, to find out. Let's see. Oh, boutiques. Red Dress Boutique is awesome. My boutique is called Chuck and L. Obviously, I rep my own boutique, um, which is only online. I don't have like a storefront in Nashville. <sighs> That's hard. I don't really shop at a ton of boutiques. I just shop like online a lot. So I'm sorry that I can't answer that. New job. Will you still be doing YouTube full time? Yes, I will. I'll just be adding um, another job on. Hi, Jackie. Okay. Got about two minutes. I'm going to go ahead and get started because I feel like all my girls are here minus a couple and they can join in um, when they get started. So if you're new, like I said before, this is my Wednesday Instagram Live devotional. I host a devotional every Wednesday, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, and I would love for you to grab the book we're in right now and join us in for the next few weeks of this book. So we are doing the book by Lisa Turkers called Uninvited. This is the book that completely changed my life for the better. Hi, Rick. I'm coming to the beach. Rick, I'm coming to visit you. Um, and we have gotten through this week, we read about three chapters a week. So this week we read chapters six, seven, and eight. And next week we'll be reading nine, 10, and 11. So we're on week three. <laughs> Amy and I are coming down. We need, I need some sun in my life. Um, anyway, so 
Basically, if you're new, this book is all about um, past rejections and in some form or another, or another, we have all been rejected, whether it's from a spouse, whether it's from an employer, whether it's from maybe one of your parents, a friend, whatever it may be. So this book has really helped me um, deal with that root of rejection and not carry it into future relationships, not carry around a bunch of unnecessary weight, um, obviously not physical weight, but the weight of the burden of rejection in your heart. So chapter six, um, oh hi Amy, <laughs> chapter six is titled Friendship Breakups. And I don't know about you, but I have had in the past couple of years, I've lost a lot of girlfriends um, and have held a lot of resentment towards them. And it's just something I've struggled with. But this book really helps me. And what we learned in these next few chapters, six, seven, and eight, really helped me to realize that they aren't the enemy. They aren't the one in the wrong. I'm not fighting with them. I'm fighting with, obviously, the devil. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, friendship breakups. So when we end a relationship or someone else ends it for us, we want to build our case and prove ourselves not guilty for what we did or whatever the situation may be. We want um, it to end up not our fault, right? We, we want to be in the right. We're always constantly building a case um, for ourselves to go up against the other person. And a lot of times that just leads to a circle around about going back and forth. They think they're right. You think you're right. It's better just to call a spade a spade and be done with it. Okay. Um, so people who care more about being right, this is what Lisa says, people who care about more about being right than ending right prove just how wrong they were all along. So if you start to view your relationships, um, kind of like you just wish them the best, even even if you your flesh doesn't wish them the best, okay, whether it be a boyfriend, whatever, if you start to view them as, number one, they're not your enemy, and you recognize who your real enemy is, um, and number two, like, stop trying to be right all the time, and just let it be what it is, because when you have to when you stop trying to be right and getting that validation of being right in a relationship, it opens up room for grace upon that other person, grace for yourself. Um, I mean, the, the checklist is endless, right? Of when you get that wall of trying to be right all the time, um, whether it be your work or a girlfriend that you have or, you know, your spouse, whatever it may be, trying to be right all the time is not going to get you anywhere, but full of pride and an ego that you just don't need to deal with. Um, turn to page 68 with me in your book. I want to read you something really fast. If I can get to it. So the fragile nature of my heart needs time, she says. So I give it just that. They say time heals, and I think this can be true, but only if it's truly, if that's truly the goal here, healing. Time grows the seeds that are planted, watered, and fertilized. Plant beauty, grow beauty. Plant thorns, grow thorns. Time will allow for either. So basically what she's saying is when you end a relationship and you're wishing bad things upon that other person or thinking about all the terrible things that they did and the wrong things that they did, you're not leaving your heart any room to offer grace to that person. And you'll immediately, the enemy will have such good hold of you that you will forget all of the good things that that person did for you or said about you or the encouragement they gave you. You'll forget all those things because obviously the enemy is really good at masking the good and making it really easy for us in the flesh to see all the bad things because that's what our flesh craves, right? Um, so we don't want to plant thorns. We want to plant really beautiful seeds in our mind and in our hearts and as, as our words. We want to plant them to be encouraging and uplifting and full of grace, okay? So we're going to learn about Abigail and I don't know if it's this chapter or the next and she's just like my favorite character of the Bible Ruth and her are 
are probably two of my very favorites, but I forgot that I learned about Abigail from this book. So I've talked about her a lot throughout my podcast. Um, anyway, so bitterness, resentment, and anger have no place in a heart as beautiful as yours. And that is the most beautiful Pinterest quote if I've ever heard one. Um, so I'll read it again. Bitterness, resentment, and anger have no place in a heart as beautiful as as yours. Once you let go of the bitterness of what that person did to you and rejected you, once you let go of the resentment you have towards that person and the anger you have towards that person, no matter what they did to you, you are helping yourself. Your situation may not change with that person. You and that person may not become friends. You may not even talk again for the rest of your lives. But knowing that you are walking with that burden lifted off your chest and that you are walking in steps to be closer to God by not having resentment. That does not come from God. Bitterness, resentment, anger, none of that comes from God. He doesn't stand for that. That's not a truth that he has written to us in the Bible. But instead, replacing that with grace, mercy, um, happiness, encouragement, those are the things that we want to be offering people um, that have done us wrong. Because I promise you, I didn't think I was going to get into this this early, but... I've talked about this many, many times. The second that you start praying for your enemies is the second that you start to see the big changes in who you are as a person. You're going to... I remember the first time I had to force myself, literally force myself to pray for somebody that had really done me wrong. And I kept thinking to myself... Lord, I don't want to pray for this person. I don't want to wish this person well. I don't want this person to have a nice, happy-go-lucky life with this other person that they left me for, right? But as you keep doing it every single day, you're diligent in your prayer that you're wishing them well, you're cutting the enemy at his knees. He's not going to be able to get to you with the resentment with the bitterness, you're going to see all of that just completely, completely go away. And I'm living proof. I never speak on anything. I say this every single week that I have not experienced myself. So if you feel bitter towards someone, the first piece of advice I have for you is to pray goodness over their life. Ask God to guide and direct their steps and to help soften your heart towards them. And I pray promise you, you will look back six months from where you are right now that you've started this journey asking and praying for your enemies, like my bunny ears, praying for your enemies, and you'll be like, oh my gosh, I get it. I so get it. And you, and it's, it's so hard. It really is so hard. And you'll have to grit your teeth and, and cry a few times if they've done you really dirty, but it's so worth it. It's so, so worth it. Okay, so no bitterness, no resentment, no anger. We're not hanging on to that anymore. We are letting it go, and we're wishing um, goodness over people's lives, no matter how dirty they've done us. So it's hard when our mind takes us back to the memories of those relationships because the conversations and connections have been hollowed out and replaced with a stabbing throb of a pierced soul. So anytime someone hurts you, um, whether it's cheating on you, whether it's firing you, whether it's... um, Whatever, whatever your situation may be, you can relate it to. Every time you think of them, you're going to have just a dagger to the heart. Every time that they're brought up with your group of friends, you're going to get angry. You're going to get mad. But I promise it's a process that will be much faster and much more graceful if you will just start right now, today, make a commitment that you're going to pray for your enemies. And I don't mean like enemies, like we're in a war with them. I just mean people that have done you wrong, that you hold bitterness against, pray for them. And it's very hard. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. Um, but just as Lisa says in this chapter, um, she says, I very, okay, let me read you Ephesians first. Ephesians six twelve says, For our struggle is not against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. 
So did you hear what that said? Your struggle is not against your flesh and blood. It's against the devil that's circling around you every single day. Um, and then Lisa goes on to say, I feel very much like my struggle was against her. Um, and she's been obviously deeply hurt by the situation. This was of a friend. If you haven't read the book, this is of a friend that she lost that didn't want to be a part of her life anymore. Um, so it's hard, obviously, to see that your struggle isn't against that person because we live of the flesh. We are human beings. That's our nature is to think, okay, my enemy is that person. Um, but those are your feelings. Ever-changing. We can't, we can't react based upon our feelings. Um, but then she goes on on page seven, 71 in the middle. She says, she may very well be the cause of some hurt in my life. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and put he in there. So I want you to listen to this if you've been hurt by a man. He may very well be the cause of some hurt in my life, but he is not the enemy. He is not your enemy. He is not my enemy. Okay? Um, so I just, I, need, I needed to get my point across that today... Our main goal is to identify who the real enemy is, and that's the devil, not the person that's in your life that's done you wrong. It's the devil. That's your enemy. Second, I want us to start praying for the person who we once identified um, as our enemy, okay? Diligently, we will pray for them. Um, so this is what it looks like to rise above the circumstances and determine to hold on to the greater good in the grand scheme of things, honoring God. Okay? So we talk about living loved and um, how do we bring the fullness of God into any situation. And really what we just said is how we do it. This whole book is how to live loved and that's how we do it. By praying for the people we don't want to pray for that have hurt us. Um just being the bigger person, you know, just, just letting it go, realizing, um, who they are, what they've done and accepting it and letting it go. Um, and it's really the only way to get to the place where we can have peace in any situation that doesn't have a storybook ending, she says. Let's see. Um, oh, and then she goes on 73. I love this. She said, I fight for her simply because I want to stay right in step with honoring God. And ultimately, that's my main goal in life is to honor God. And if that means um, gritting my teeth and biting my tongue and um, shedding a few tears through a prayer of wishing goodness and peace upon their life for them to do um, the will of the kingdom, then so be it. And it's blessed me. In more ways than one, okay? Um, I just got way ahead of my notes here. Hi, everybody that just joined. She says, we have an enemy. It's not each other. Um, let's move on to chapter 7. And everybody can relate to this chapter. I don't care who you are, man, woman, employed, not employed, in a relationship, not in a relationship. Chapter 7 is when our normal gets snatched. Think back to your life when um, you were just uprooted. You're going along, going along, going along each day, and then something happens one day, and it's a day you'll never forget. It's a day that caused you a lot of pain, but you have two choices of how to go forward from that day. You can choose the path of honoring God and knowing that God is good. Um, God is good at being God and he has everything under control. Or you can go the other route of living in your flesh, trying to figure out everything on your own. And that's really just a detour. Because ultimately, we're all going to get to the place where we realize um, whose way is the right way, okay? Um, anyway, so when our normal get snatched, and this beginning of this chapter 
is basically Lisa telling a story about a breakup. And um, I'm not going to go like too much into this because if you want to listen to me go in depth about where I was six months ago dealing with a breakup, I have a podcast, Faithfully Yours, on iTunes and Spotify. You can listen to week three. Um, but she says this that's really beautiful, and I just want to read this to you right now. She says, because all of a sudden, you're going to relate to this if you've been through what I'm talking about. The rest of my planned out life was a flame. I wasn't losing a boyfriend today. I was losing the connection to all those dreams for tomorrow that now would never be. And that's basically what I meant by your life being uprooted because you have all these plans and all these ideas and all these dreams with this one person and they willingly, they choose to leave you there alone by yourself and not do life with you anymore. And that's like one of the ultimate rejections and it's not fun and it's hurtful and especially when there's another like woman or man involved you just feel all kinds of ways, you know? Um, and she says, rejection always leaves the deepest, darkest marks. And, you know, I sort of agree with that and I sort of don't because where there once was like this calloused um, heart that I had because of that rejection, there are such beautiful opportunities growing from those places that once were callous. There are such, I envision this like dried out desert land of a heart that I once had and not too long ago, right? And, and over time, not just because of a certain person, just because of God's grace and mercy and his love for me. It's like the Texas, Texas, um, fields of flowers. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but they're absolutely stunning. And it's just flowers for, for, all the miles you could possibly see, these beautiful, beautiful blue bonnet flowers. And that's kind of what I feel like my heart is like starting to look like again. There's some life in there. There's some love in there again. There's there's all these things that, that once I thought would never be there. Um, so I sort of agree with her in that. I sort of don't. Okay, page 76. She says, I don't want my normal to be snatched away. Life feels impossibly risky when I'm reminded how unpredictable circumstances can shatter and forever change what I know and love about my life. Um, and in the fallout, some pieces never find a way to fall back into place. Honestly, whatever you're going through that you feel like your life, that part has been uprooted and you feel alone, you feel rejected, um, or you have in the past, you won't want those pieces that you once wanted to fit together. You won't want those pieces to fit together anymore. You'll be thankful that God had a different plan for your life. You will see it. You will see his hand. You can trace his hand in your life. It just requires time. And it just requires um, patience with him, with God, to do his work. And while you're waiting on that beautiful moment, that moment that you realize, man, I am so glad I'm not where I was. I'm so glad that God saved me from that life that I wanted so badly. Um, you'll never forget that moment of you just have that come to Jesus, I call it. <laughs> you have the come to Jesus where you're just like, oh. Thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you um, for wanting the best for me because God is so good. He wants the very best for you. Um, I feel like I had another point to that and I got derailed, but that's okay. Oh, the puzzle. You don't want those pieces. Trust me. The pieces were never meant to fit together perfectly. There's another piece you haven't gotten to yet. That is the perfect puzzle piece. So you just need to be patient and hopeful. Um, she holds on to faith for, or she holds on to hope for he is forever faithful. And that's one of my favorite verses because he is so faithful. She said, um, I have to wrestle through the fact that they wanted this. 
They cho chose to cut themselves out, though you're devastated. They're possibly walking away feeling relieved. Um, or worse, they might even feel happy. And there you sit, staring at jacked up photographs with no glue in the world could fix. Normal has been taken, not by accident, but very much on purpose by someone you never expected um, could be such a thief. And for me, I think about now, I think about my dad, like, is he happy that we don't talk? Is he, um, is his life less burdened because I'm not in it anymore? And I don't know. And I probably won't ever know. But it's not for me to hold on to. It's not for me to worry about. It's, it's, if I think about that too much, of course I'll feel rejected and of course I'll feel subpar, you know, but you can't think about that. You can't, um, can't think about it. You just have to keep moving on and not let the enemy get into your head. Okay. Page 80. I want to read something to you. Um, and then we're going to talk about Abigail. So what we thought was beautiful and stable leaves us scared and fragile and more vulnerable than ever. Hi, Gabby. I'm so glad you could join. Um, and once you've been rejected like that, you almost crave in a sick kind of way the negativity. Hi, Susie. <laughs> you, um, she says, I start to develop a craving for malice. Um, and then she goes on to say, but God, he's there. The one who I proclaimed is good, good to me and good at being God. The one with whom I have, am living a love story and I know I can't continue to fully embrace God while rejecting his ways. Grace given when it feels least deserved is the only antidote for bitter rot. Um, and that's so true. And she says on page 81, not now grace turns into right now grace. I realize if I don't cooperate with grace in this moment, for this thief, for that friend, for my dad, for that teacher, I will carry the stench of the bitter box and rub it off on all um, who come close to me. And this realization makes me so annoyed. Um, and she says, But seeking what's fair never cracked the world open to reveal the beautiful reality of a Jesus-loving woman. Um, only a pure heart with space for grace can do that. If you don't have space in your heart for grace for people um you're gonna be miserable you're gonna be bitter you're going to be holding on to things you were never meant to hold on to feelings that are gonna weigh you down drag you down you're gonna miss divine opportunities because you are choosing to hold on to something you were never meant to even think twice about um and the more that you can trust that God is good, that every single thing you come to, um, he will help you through, through his strength. It's just, um, it's just important for us to leave as much room, no matter what happens to us, um, leave as much room as we possibly can for as much grace as we can possibly fit into our hearts for people because we don't know what they're going through. We don't truly know what's inside another person's head or heart. Um, as much as they tell us, as much as they are an open person, um, you, you just don't know. You just don't know. And, and I, I believe that you know people will show their true colors. They'll show you who they are. And when they do... You just give them grace to be who they are and work through all of their problems and their issues and things they need to fix. Because honestly, when you look in the mirror and you have this person you don't like, this picture right next to you, you're just as guilty as your own faults, um, of your own faults, as they are of theirs. They might not be the same, but they're comparable, I'm sure. So let's stop being judgmental. Let's stop holding grudges. Let's stop being bitter towards people. Let's just move forward with grace in our heart. Um, so each hole left from rejection must be an opportunity to create more and more space for grace in my heart. So we're not becoming bitter. We're becoming better. 
Um, okay. Abigail. I can't wait to share Abigail with you. Um, so basically there's a woman named Abigail in 1 Samuel 25. And she had to choose between grace and bitterness. So she was a woman that knew hardship. She knew rejection. She was married to Nabal, who I'll explain about in just a minute. Um, and basically she knew about things not really turning out the way that she would hope for. Um, but you see throughout 1 Samuel how she just remains very steady. And I imagine that we don't know enough about Abigail to know how she got to be so steady. But I think a big chunk of it was being the wife of Nabal. Um, so that steadiness that I was just talking about had a profound impact on the life of David, who was King David, who killed Goliath, um, or he was going to be king. He wasn't king when... She knew him. He was going to be king. Um, she's not really talked about a ton. And we don't really know too much about her. But we know this one story that we're about to go through. And for me, it's life-changing to hear this story and see the humility that she portrays. Um, so she was married to a fool named Nabal. And Nabal in Hebrew actually means fool. So you can look it up. You can Google it. You can fact check me. Um, and Nabal had totally offended David. So David was, I believe, Nabal's um, watched over his sheep. Yeah, his herds. Herds, I'm assuming it was sheep. Um, so David and his men served Nabal, and um, since it was feast day one day, um, he sent a message to Nabal, and he asked for his favor, which basically was the equivalent. It was food, but it was the equivalent of, like Lisa says, a hamburger and a glass of water. So it wasn't anything extravagant. It was just a little treat, if you will. Midnight snack. Um, and of course, Nabal denied David because tons and tons of people were getting what they wanted and then going against their, um, their superiors and all these things. So he just didn't have a lot of trust that he was selfish. He was just selfish. Nabal was very selfish. Um, so in turn to that, David vowed to kill Nabal and all the males belonging to him. Brutal. So Brutal. Uh, like, very dramatic. Like, David, you're being dramatic. You need to sit down. Um, anyway, so that's what he vowed to do. But um, Abigail, literally, as David's about to go kill Nabal, bows down in front of David, who was below her at this point in his life. He was below her. He worked. It's like you going to a con, you like someone that's doing construction on your house and you bowing down at their feet. Like you're paying them, you know? And she bows down at his feet and she says, My Lord, um, do not put the blame on my husband. Put it on me. It's my fault. That's like summing it up. Um, it, Lisa says it really beautifully. She says, But instead of filling up this rejected space with insecurity, she found stability by filling it with grace. The more she hurt, the more she learned how to help others who were hurt. Um, so she quickly bowed down before David. And she says in 1 Samuel 25, 24, on me alone, my Lord, be the blame. Um, ew. Like, Abigail, what are you doing defending your disgusting husband who is selfish and can't even give this dude a hamburger. Like, let's put it into real life perspective. Ew. Like, how many of us would really do that? I would have left him. Honestly, if, if knowing what I know about Abigail and knowing what I know about Nabal, I would have left him high and dry for somebody else. Years ago. Years and years ago. But she stuck it out because she knew the commitment before God. She knew that she, that was her husband. She didn't have a choice. So, um, 
really incredible. Really incredible. Um, then on page 85, if you want to, I'm just like kind of paraphrasing, reading along. Her giving grace doesn't justify her husband or validate David. It saves her. So it makes David stop what he's doing. Obviously, this woman is bowing down to him, who he works for. Um, but that grace gives her the upper hand. And Lisa says she refuses to be a victim of circumstance she can't fully change. Instead, she changes what she can. So not only was she having to bow down, she had the humiliation of being known that she was married to a fool. You know, so that was that was something that really, um, it's kind of like women that stay with abusers or stay with people, uh, men that, that are alcoholics. You know, it's, you don't understand it, but they made that commitment and they're in it. And maybe that's how they think is the way Abigail thought. I don't know. Um, so with victory in mind, she bows low before David and with great courage allows the mantle of blame to be placed on her shoulders. Um, the more she cooperated with grace, the more her humiliation turned into humility. Humility can't be bought at a bargain price. It's the long working of grace upon grace within the hurt of our hearts. Humility opens the ears of opportunity. I love that. So obviously in the next chapter, we learn what happens. Um, like the conversation that her and David have. Um, but it's it's an amazing speech. And it's she has in big bold letters here. If you don't have the book, I'm going to read this to you. It's impossible to hold up the banners of victim and victory at the same time. You have two choices. You can be the victim or you can be the winner. And I'm choosing to be the winner. I hope you are too. Um, let's move on to chapter eight because I have 30 minutes and this is like a really long, really long one. Okay. This is called, she titled it the corrective experience. Um, so let me just kind of catch you up if you don't have the book. Basically, Lisa gets an email from someone that's on her committee. They're working for a project with the school and they have to go back to the drawing board because it just didn't go as planned and they need to refigure some things about not changing the ticket prices. And someone doesn't agree with that and gets very offended and resigns from her position. So obviously, Lisa feels very rejected um, from this situation. She starts asking, am I a bad leader? Do the other members want to resign too? What if they all quit? And what if I'm left to do this alone? So obviously when something bad happens or when something like that happens, we're rejected. Our mind, the enemy makes our mind start turning circles and we start doubting ourselves. We start talking bad things upon ourselves and we just go in this like snowball effect that's really completely unnecessary, but it's just the enemy's way to get you from seeing the truth of the situation and the truth of who you are. Um, let's see. Page 89, 89, 90, different people with differing perspectives will find themselves in difficult situations unless they determine to discuss things well. So we're talking about how to communicate. Relationships don't come in packages of perfection. Relationships come in packages of potential. They have the potential to be great, but they also have the potential to be hard at times. No matter what it takes to work, um, sorry, no matter what, it takes work to make it work. And wrapped in between the wonderful and the work are the inevitable times of imperfection and possible rejection. So whether you're in a marriage of 10 years, whether you're in a newfound relationship, um, whether you got a new job with a new boss, new coworkers, there's going to be times where... You feel rejected. Your idea is rejected. Um, you worked really hard. You're super excited. I'll put it into, um, I'll give you an example of my life. I find this house. It's incredible. It's the perfect house. Ultimately, I'm rejected just because it's a little bit too much money. Um, so, obviously, I can go into defense mode and say, okay, well, my work is not appreciated. 
Um, you don't value my opinion, blah, blah, blah. I'm done. I'm not going to, I'm not going to even discuss this with you. Um, yada, yada. Or you can say in the relationship, in that relationship, you could say like, okay, I see what you mean. Um, let's, let's move on to the next one. Instead of def you know, defeating yourself or being defeated by that person, but also defeating yourself with your thoughts and your words you're saying about yourself. Just take the high road. Just communicate how you're feeling. Um, but also remember that great relationships, you're always going to have some sort of rejection. So it's, it's going to make it great by communicating well. And I just went in a big circle, but that's basically what she's saying with that whole paragraph. Um, so she says, relationships don't come in packages of perfection. Relationships come in packages of potential. So communication is a big, big part of that. Um, so then she goes on to, for about, I think, four pages to talk about, no, two pages, to talk about how you, instead of approaching a conversation with a you should or you could have done this, replacing that with me too. So instead of you should consider or you should think of or you should stop this or you could start that, we could instead meet them right where they are, just as God meets us every day right where we are, meet that person, your significant other, your boss, your employee, whoever it may be, meet them right where they are and say, you know what, me too. Find a way to relate to that person with something that you've gone through and just talk it out, but don't all of a sudden, um, which I'm guilty of many times, saying you should have done this or you should have done that and we would have had a better result. Meet them where they are and say, you know what, me too. I've had this happen and this is how we're, this is how we could better work it out. You know, communication, all about communication. Um, let's go back to the story of Abigail and David, and I'm going to, or Lisa is going to help us see how Abigail used the Me Too in her conversation. Um, she acknowledged right away that her husband had acted foolishly toward David. Um, but the way she said it let David know Abigail was also a victim of Nabal's foolishness. It says in 1 Samuel 25, 25, his name is fool and folly goes with him wherever he goes. So she acknowledged his hurt from the situation and she also said, you know what, me too. He's hurt, me too. Um, she didn't use the words me too. She certainly used the sentiment of this powerful two-word statement. So she made it very clear, um, and she basically, this is how Lisa lines it out. He treated you poorly, David. Me too, I understand. He didn't think about caring for you. Me too, I understand. He didn't appreciate what you've done for him. Me too, I understand. So she recognized how he was feeling and then became relatable to David, and that ultimately saved her husband's life and probably her own. Um... David didn't want a lesson from Abigail. He just wanted food and respect. Um, so she came prepared to acknowledge his need. Um, so even that was a Me Too statement because she gave him, ultimately ended up giving him food. Um, she said, you, you do deserve food, absolutely, and... Basically, let David know he did belong, that what he was doing for Nabal was important and that she appreciated it and that, you know what, Nabal's just an idiot kind of thing. So then Lisa says on page 95, acceptance is like an antibiotic that prevents past rejections from turning into present day infections. Um... When some of, someone of great significance in our lives makes us feel like our belonging is more of a question mark than a security blanket, we become very sensitive to even the slightest hints of rejection 
the wound is reopened and the rejections infection sets in. And that's very, very true. Um, David's story started with his dad, Jesse. Oh, gosh, I only have two minutes. I'm going to have to sign off and sign back in for those of you that are following um, because I have been on here for an hour. So go back to my profile, and I'll be live in just one second. Hi. <laughs> hey, Jackie. Okay, so sorry about that. I thought I had gotten good at not being on here for over an hour, but sometimes I run over, you know? Okay, just a few more minutes, and then I'll um, let you guys go. <laughs> so... She says, okay, sorry, I just want to make sure everyone gets back in here. Um, okay. Okay, I think everyone's back in here. So sorry. So... Lisa says a wonderful um, quote. She says, extreme reactors are usually dealing with compound factors. So anytime something happens in our life, um, we're going to have, how do I say this? Anytime you see someone or you are interacting with someone and they react in a certain way that you're thinking, geez, like, calm down, geez, what's really going on? What's really the problem here? They probably are coming from a place of rejection from a previous relationship that is, you know, it's making your situation with them extreme. Oh, your lashes are amazing. Thank you. They're uh, strip lashes. Um, so basically, Abigail soothed the deep wound that Nabal had opened Ultimately, David was rejected um, when he was the youngest son by his father, Jesse. And, you know, that same day he was, you know, um, spoken over him that he was going to be the king. But it still left him with all this rejection. So when Nabal rejected him, Abigail came in and just completely soothed that wound. So she revisited, revisited the place the hurt place of David's heart with healing words that corrected or rewrote the lies that had wounded him so deeply. And if we would do that by offering grace to more people in our lives, um, we could really help them, you know, to, to heal up that wound of rejection that maybe they've experienced before. Um, oh, geez. I didn't know you guys weren't in here yet. Sorry, sorry. Um, okay, let's see. 99. Okay, page 100 if you want to read along. Me too and you do belong are powerful words. Not just for Abigail and David, but for all of us. These are soothing statements that can calm and heal Beautiful realities for us to receive them, um, to receive from God personally and believe, and they are incredible truths to stick in our back pockets as gifts to be given in conversations with others. So let your past rejections and experiences work for you instead of against you by allowing them to help you sense the possible pain behind other people's rejections. Try to see things from their vantage points and think of how they might be hurting in this situation. And basically, she says and sums it all up by saying, all of this will help you to stop the cycle of rejection and hurt in the other person's life and in your own life. And I love that. And I had a note here that I copied from last time we did this book. Um, just a little prayer of, Lord, let us love with eyes wide open. 
let us love from a place that we are not quick to get angry and not quick to judge, but we are quick to offer grace and stability and soothing words to those that are already hurting or have been hurting for a long time. Okay, so I hope you guys enjoyed these three chapters. I think that these three chapters outlined the foundation for the next six months of my life from December. So if you are where I was six months ago, and um, if you want to know where that where that was, um, you can listen to my podcast, Faithfully Yours. Um, just go back to my testimony, which is the first episode. But basically, um, these words that she wrote in these three chapters um, changed my life, completely changed my life, set a foundation um, for me to stand firm upon for forever. And I hope that it has done that for you. I hope that anytime you feel like you're slipping, that you will just, um, or slipping off that foundation, that you will just go back to these three chapters reread them over and over and over again because the second time around it has a whole new meaning to me. I mean it still means the same things but my eyes are so open to um, things I didn't know about before and it's easier to process and really dig in deeper with what she's saying. So I'm going to pray for you guys and then I will let you go. Next week's chapters for next Wednesday uh, are going to be 9, 10, and 11. So read those from your book and um, we'll discuss them next Wednesday. And um, yeah, so if you would like to pray with me, you can bow your head. If not, you can just watch me and then I'll let you guys go. Uh, Dear Lord, thank you so much for this wonderful book that has changed many, many people's lives and for these beautifully written words that tell us the stories of Abigail and David and even Nabal, Lord, that we can learn from them, that we can um, even to this day, thousands of years later, we can um, make our lives better by using principles from Abigail's life and David's life and even Nabal's life, Lord. Thank you for guiding us, directing us throughout this next week. Let us learn so much about who we are um, in you through these next few chapters, Lord. And thank you for this unconventional way of meeting together on Wednesdays to um, just give you the praise, Lord. And we thank you for everything that you've given us, all of our many blessings, Lord. And I pray um, peace and happiness and um, good faith and hope over each and every single person listening and watching, Lord, and for whoever hasn't accepted you and Jesus in their hearts, Lord, that they would take this time just to pray a prayer of acceptance of Jesus, that they would they would speak it over themselves, that they are going to no longer live the life um, of selfish human flesh, that they're going to live the life of Jesus that lives for you, Lord. Uh, thank you for everything, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay. That light is so bright. Okay, I hope you guys have a wonderful week. If you have any questions, prayer requests, you can DM me. And um, I love talking to you guys. And oh, thank you, Brent. Yes, thank you, Carrie. I love you guys so much. I'm going to go eat my chicken Alfredo if you want that. Um... Trader Joe's Tacos uh, blog post, then DM me and let me know. And I'll see you next Wednesday. Bye.